It's probably the most famous or infamous jumping on the bed story since Bill Cosby's childhood confessions from five decades ago. In recent years, there has been gossip galore about visitors to the White House who, for a generous contribution to the president's re-election fund, were given the privilege of sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom. But the story that broke the camel's back was about a Hollywood actress named Marky Post and fellow Clinton supporter Linda Bloodworth Thomason. Not only were the two White House guests staying in the executive mansion, they were also jumping up and down on the bed in the Lincoln bedroom. Well, I'm sure there are many, many told and untold stories about the silly goings on at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. My four brothers and I will confess that we didn't have springs in our beds when we grew up on the farm. But whenever we were guests at someone else's house, well, we loved to jump up and down on the springs. Maybe remember when John F. Kennedy was in the White House? Little three-year-old John John called his daddy a foo-foo head. And the chief executive of our nation looked at him with mock sternness. John, he scolded. You cannot call the president of the United States of America a foo-foo head. And we smile at that one. But the image of two grown women giddily jumping up and down on the bed where President Abraham Lincoln, who freed the slaves and gave this reunited country the Gettysburg Address, used to rest after a day of building up the nation's wounds? Well, it did not sit well with many Americans. Peggy Noonan, a former speechwriter for the Reagan White House, wrote a scolding article in the Reader's Digest pointing out that these people had lost all sense of decorum. You simply don't do that. It doesn't show proper respect for the office, for the heritage of the greatness that ought to reside in that grand old house. Well, this gets back to a King James sounding expression from chapter 14 of Revelation. As we think about the powerful warning message of these three angels flying in the midst of heaven, here in Revelation chapter 14, that first angel begins by saying to the world, Fear God. Fear God and give glory to Him. The point not being that people should shrink away in terror from God, but that they should have a proper respect for Him, an awe that is comfortable, if you know God and are in relationship with Him, but an awe that is still very real, very life-changing. I remember attending the National Religious Broadcasters Convention and listening to born-again Christian Chuck Colson. You remember? He used to walk the halls of the White House, power, and sit in their inner sanctum, probably put his feet up on the furniture with his boss, Richard Nixon. He saw both the hallowed side and the seamy side. He finally went to jail, partly because he too didn't fully appreciate the need to respect the gravity of where he was. This was the White House. This was a place for truth and for justice and for integrity. He does write how most of the time, visitors who came into the Oval Office, some of them planning to tell old Nixon a thing or two, generally got very quiet when they realized that this was the place. This was where the power and authority were. What does it mean to fear God in the sense that we reverence Him? Well, first of all, we recognize Him for who He is. And one of the big points of these three angels' messages is to remind us that God the Father is our Creator. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. We'll return to that concept later, but this is one reason why we owe God our reverence. He made us. Just because of that, we would owe Him. Now, God has done so much more for us than to simply jumpstart our existences. But it begins there. We fear and reverence God because He made this universe by His own spoken word. He is our creator, our designer, 
our maker. And so we ought not to jump on the bed, especially in his presence. It's interesting that one of the world's greatest kings, a man who himself commanded respect and power and authority, mirrors almost word for word the message of these three angels. King Solomon. After years of careless living, of partying with his own White House, with call girls and presidential interns, pushes it all to the side and comes to his senses. At the very end of his memoirs, which we know in the Bible as the book of Ecclesiastes, he has this to say for our edif edification. Now all that has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Notice Solomon's two conclusions as to why we should respect God. First of all, because he has called his followers to obey. Respect God and obey him, he says. And you know, as we explore more closely these three angels' messages in Revelation 14, we're going to find that same challenge there to be obedient to God, to show respect by obeying, by following Him. Just a few chapters over in Revelation is a fantastic verse describing the people of God in the last generations of time. And the Bible says very clearly, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Every time I read those words, I just want to get on my knees and make this pledge. Jesus, I'll go wherever you lead me. I'll do whatever you ask me to do, every day and every time. Because that's how we show God our respect. Uh, point number two, these last days are a time for respect because the hour of his judgment has come. Admittedly, when cop cars squeal toward us with red lights flashing, most of us are likely to run in the other direction. Because, as they used to say rather frivolously on the old TV show Laugh-In, here comes the judge. And if judgment is a serious matter by a serious God at a serious time in history, then it is a time to be respectful. It's not a time for jumping on beds or for going our own way. But now to the all-important question. What kind of judgment is coming up? That is crucial to our study, certainly, because we're told to show respect or biblical fear precisely in response to the fact of judgment coming. Fear God and give glory to Him because the hour of His judgment is come. Well, there are those who will propose that only the wicked people will be judged, or perhaps only those who are living carelessly outside of a relationship with God, those who are jumping on the bed, so to speak. It's even suggested that God himself is somehow on trial here at the end, that he will be judged by how he judges. We're actually going to find that the Bible clearly teaches four aspects of judgment involving different groups and happening at different times. But King Solomon and these three angels are united in telling us that there most certainly will be a judgment scene. And no matter what the details are, when God, the ruler over heaven and earth, is involved in any kind of judgment, it is a grand and sober time. A time to look up, not look away. A time to take off your hat and your shoes because the ground is holy and God is especially holy. I like the plain interpretation to be found in the clear word paraphrase, which is not a Bible, but a marvelous resource for study and reflection. Notice how my friend and author Jack Blanco renders this message by the first angel. Then the scene changed. And I saw an angel flying high in the air, carrying the last message of God's good news to every nation, race, tribe, and language. He called out in a loud voice for everyone to hear, saying, Stand in awe of God. 
That's good, isn't it? And give glory to him because the time has come for him to clear his name and to judge the world. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Even Jesus clearly taught about the judgment. Remember the story of the sheep and the goats, for instance? So it is a sober time, a real thing. But in Matthew 13, he gives us another parable. Remember the story about the wheat and the tares? Good crops with a whole bunch of weeds planted in among them, ruining things, choking everything. And the owner says, an enemy has done this. What shall we do? Asks the servant. This is terrible. And the owner says very calmly, still in control, leave it all right there. Let them both be for now. Let them both grow. But in the end, when it comes time for the harvest, the weeds will be bundled up and destroyed. So it's serious stuff, isn't it? Notice, though, that the judgment, the bundling up and destroying conclusion, happens at the end of time. So judgment is a last day experience. That's why these three angels are a last day phenomenon, a spiritual opportunity for now, for you and for me. But through it all, good news, because Jesus saves.